And now I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. Hear the word of the Lord. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards, towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to Him. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In you, O Lord my God, have I put my hope. In you have I trusted. Let me not be ashamed, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let me hand the way for you to be put to shame, but let those that break faith be put on the ground and carry nothing. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in the ways of your truth and teach me, for you are my God and my salvation. In you have I hoped all the day long, because of your goodness, O Lord. Call to mind your compassion and the love of my hands, for they are from the Lord. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions, but according to your mercy, think on me. Good and God is the Lord, therefore we be direct sinners in his way. The meek he will guide in the path of justice, and teach the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are faithful and true, and for those who keep his covenant and his commandments. Amen. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. 
And just as he, came, he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts. The angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. We ask you to open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word through Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. Please be seated. So here we are on the last Sunday of February. Um, I always want to get annual vestry behind so that we can get on with the rest of the year. Uh, but for reasons of um, administration, we kind of delay as long as possible. Vestry is supposed to be held, um, annual vestry meeting in each parish is supposed to be held on or before the 15th of March every year. And somehow I think it is fitting that we begin Lent with a time of looking back and considering how we're going to move forward um, in the way we do things. And there are lots of things that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at our various ministries. We're going to be looking at our administration. We're going to be looking at what I believe perhaps is an important focus for this year, a priority for this year. But how does this all come together in the Gospel of Mark and as we begin Lent with the reading of Genesis and Noah? Um, I, I just remember that thing of um, Bill Cosby and he doing a story on Noah and he says, I'm going to make it rain for 4,000 days and 4,000 nights of drowning right out. And then Noah says, well, you know, do this to save water. Make it rain for 40 days and 40 nights and wait for the sewers to back up. <laughs> the author of the Gospel of Mark uses his initial words to move the reader very quickly into the story of Jesus. In 11 very brief verses, we see Jesus in three critical and a kind of fulcrum settings. First, his baptism, revealing him as the anointed one of God, is the starting point of it all. The third setting is the beginning of the rest of the story. Jesus emerging among the people to begin his mystery, ministry of proclaiming the good news, living out and bringing to humankind the salvation of God. But there's that little bit in between, and if you weren't very wide awake, you would have uh, missed it. But since we're at the beginning of Lent, maybe you didn't. That little bit is where Mark describes a second setting, one that flowed from the first and provided empowerment for the third. Immediately after his baptism, 
the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, a separate place, far away from the hungry crowds that would follow him throughout his mission. This, dear friends, was the only place and the only sustained time he would have to wrestle with the forces that worked against God's will for him. It wasn't a choice for him to go there. It was a godly necessity. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness, not like a chauffeur in a limousine, all nice and cushy, but drove him more like a, I don't know if you've been to the, the Cape lately, but more like a driver of a donkey cart getting a stubborn mule to move forward. Come on, get going, get going. Before he could begin work as God's beloved, Jesus had to face hard realities. He had to prepare for the test that would eventually ensure his obedience to God, even unto death. The test involved beating down temptations to follow the ways of the world instead of the pathway of God. Temptations to give in to the seductive power that the powers that work against love, that work against grace. Though he was alone, Jesus was actually comforted in the form of angels by the same spirit that announced him as God's beloved and that required his 40-day fast in a dark place of ultimate danger. And then there is this passage in today's reading from God. He was with the wild beasts. And this little phrase, the wild beasts, amplifies the difficulty of Jesus' time in the wilderness and serves as a symbol of the strength of the temptations that confronted him. The Greek word used for beasts refers to animals with a brutal nature. Not Isaiah's image, this is why I thought I had Isaiah in my mind, sorry Doug. Um, not Isaiah's image of lambs lying down with lions, there's a picture of it over there. Um, being tempted by Satan was as demanding as wild animals threatening to devour him. So, St. Mark reveals a vivid scene, but with a very brief description, leaving us to imagine the details. Perhaps the image of the beasts can help us understand the lonely ordeal of Jesus' experience. He had to face the powers that would seek to prevent him from doing God's will in his coming ministry. And I guess that's a little bit of us. Uh, I think many people who have a conversion experience are actually driven into a space of desolation after that. You know, you get the spiritual eye and something more. And I think that it's in that that God's Spirit upholds us so that we become energized to move forward in our ministry. In responding to God's gracious love, we find ourselves once more in Lent. As today's colleague reminds us, we are also tempted, just like he was, we are called to dedicate ourselves to, in our weakness, to face the same tests that Jesus confronted in his wilderness experience. But we don't have to do it alone, because each of us can find God mighty to save us. In our various kinds of wilderness experiences, we also struggle against the wild beasts of our time and our lives. And when doing so, we can learn from Jesus, um, from his um, wilderness experience, 
wilderness. He encountered all the evil that there is because he found in himself, in his own humanity, those things that would distract him from the path that God had laid out for him. For in every human being lies the best of God and the very worst of the world. In the wilderness, the aim of the tempter was to move Jesus from faith in God to doubt. The forces that worked against God also press us towards selfishness and away from love. Jesus resisted temptation by keeping himself connected to God. And that is exactly how we can resist the beasts of our lives. How we can overcome the evil that lurks within each one of us and the sin that is a part of our world. All that lingers in the midst of our humanity. We resist as Jesus did, by staying connected to God through the power of the scriptures, prayer, sacraments, and through regular, regular self-examination and confession, through repenting of our sins, accepting God's forgiveness, and re leading renewed and transformed lives. By these means, we defeat all that is evil in our world we ourselves overcome all the temptations that are placed in front of us. Yes, we can defeat these beasts, as Jesus did, by staying connected to God. Maybe that's the part where I bring in the theme for this, um, this uh, our sort of theme. Encounter and conversation with Jesus Christ. It's an encounter, it's a conversation. As long as we are doing that, we will overcome those things that lead us astray. The thing is, it means we don't do it alone. As the angels waited on Jesus and in his wilderness experience, we ourselves are sustained by the Holy Spirit of God and through the aid of God's beloved disciples in and around us, our brothers and sisters in Christ who minister to us and help us face the beasts of our lives as they face theirs. Just as Jesus' time in the wilderness came after his baptism, so does ours, as our Christian formation continues to flow from the foundation of our baptism. Self-examination during Lent comes as an essential reappraisal in the midst of our journeys. Faith takes form in our baptism renunciations. That's why over the last year or two, I've been really pushing home the renewal of our baptismal promises. As we promise of baptism, we commit to turning away from all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God. We commit to turning away from the powers of this world that destroy and corrupt what God has created. And as we renew our baptism promises, we'll do that at Easter again. We set aside all our personal desires that lead us away from the love of God. The beasts that we encounter in our wilderness reflect the power of evil that is real and very, very, very active in our lives. If we dare become self-aware, we see it. We hear it. We feel it. It is a power that gets inside us and an influence that comes from outside of us. A force that draws us towards all that is wrong. It is personal because it deals with each of us as a person. It deals with each of us individually in our darkest and most trying moments. Evil can enter our lives when hard decisions need to be made and we encounter it most strongly in those areas where we are weakest in our desire to serve ourselves first.
through greed, excessive pride, divisiveness and prejudice, gluttony of food and material possessions, the desire to control others, cowardice, faithlessness, many other forms of selfishness that draw us away from God. Above all, the temptations we fight are destructive. Satan's beasts find a way to poison and harm what is good and loving in the world and in our lives and even within our own community here as Christians. The evil that works in us is our enemy, seeking to grab hold of us to work against God and against our brothers and sisters whom we hurt when we give in to such powers. The evil also works against us individually, eating us from the inside out. It's like that thing I say about holding a grudge. It's like taking rat poison and hoping the rat will die. The temptations that Jesus met in the wilderness are also our temptations, drawing us to a selfishness that prevents us from showing love and respect to others, pressing us to manipulate the world into the form that we want rather than that which God intended. But the power of God's love can help us resist the temptations and defeat the beasts that dwell among us. From our baptism, we again Sorry. From our baptism, dear friends, we gain the sign that marks us as Christ's forever. Remember at our baptism, at each one of us is marked with the sign of the cross, so that we are signed as one of Christ's. Our success in resisting evil, turning from our sins into lives renewed in love, moves us beyond our time in the wilderness. And as recipients of the good news Jesus proclaims, we ourselves are empowered by the reality of God's kingdom that has come near. And we can become a people who, with God's love, can transform the world. Amen.